Hello. I hope you're all feeling very relaxed. I am. Um, that was a fantastic session. Um, and we have yet another fantastic session, which is called Climate Justice Means Racial Justice. Um, we have the New York Times, Veronica Chambers is going to be leading this conversation with David Lamy. And um, this is going to be, I think, a, one of the highlights of the day. So um, remain calm, remain zen, and absorb the next, next session. I want to just thank Morgan Stanley uh, for their support of this. And we'd just like to play a short video before Veronica and David come up. Thank you very much. I'm Audrey Joy, Chief Sustainability Officer at Morgan Stanley and CEO of the Institute for Sustainable Investing. Welcome to the New York Times Climate Hub taking place alongside COP26. I'm particularly excited about the conversation we're about to have on climate justice as racial justice. For too long, climate change has been thought of separately from social justice issues, whereas unfortunately it is all too clear that climate change is a social justice issue. Globally, low-income communities of color disproportionately suffer the effects of climate change. To cite just one particularly dramatic data point, a recent study in the United States found that low-income communities of color can register temperatures of up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than wealthier communities. That's because they lack trees, parks, and other amenities that could otherwise provide climate resilience. As world leaders and business leaders gather here at COP26 to chart the way forward for climate action, racial justice must be integral to all of those conversations and to all of the solutions we try to devise to move forward. I'm very pleased now to hand it over to our distinguished panel. I'm sure you will find this conversation as worthwhile and important as I do. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm round of applause to Veronica Chambers and David Lamy. Welcome, I'm Veronica Chambers. I'm Narrative Projects Editor at the New York Times, and I'm gonna be your moderator today. I'll introduce our panel, starting with the disting distinguished, Honorable David Lammy, Member of Parliament and Shadow of Secretary of State for Justice. His 2020 TED Talk, Climate Justice Can't Happen Without Racial Justice, gets right to the heart of the topic we'll be discussing today. We've got three panelists joining us remotely. Hello, Varshini Prakash. I'm so happy to see you. Um, Varshini is co-founder and executive director of Sunrise, a movement of young people working to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process through the Green New Deal. Welcome, Varshini. We have Gloria Walton, who is CEO and president of the Solutions Project an award-winning community organizer and writer. Her work centers on resourcing innovative climate justice solutions from communities at the front lines of crisis. Last but certainly not least, we have Nick St. Fleur. Nick is a general assignment reporter at STAT covering racial health disparities. He won the 2021 Everett Clark Seth Payne Award for Young Science Journalists and was a 2020 Knight Wallace Fellow. Prior to STAT, he was a science reporter at a little paper called the New York Times, covering archaeology, paleontology, and space. Welcome, Nick. Thanks. So I, I want to get started right away with the conversation. We're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, MP Lamy, we know that the patterns of colonization parallel and intersect with the drivers of climate change. Expansion, exploitation, and extraction. You talked about this in your talk, and you said that um, climate change was in some ways colonial's nat colonialism's natural conclusion. In week two of COP, what do you want people to know about racial justice and climate change? Yes, we're in a climate emergency, but I, if you want profound change, that's transformation. Um, that sets us on a very different path. Then you have to ground that emergency in climate justice, because climate justice gets you to equity. And equity challenges 
what has gone before. So when I say that where we are, um, the climate emergency is colonialism's natural conclusion, it is an understanding that at the heart of colonialism um, was an extractive economy. At the heart of colonialism um, was fossil fuels. At the heart of colonialism was a disregard uh, for black and brown people wherever they were found in the global south. Um, it includes my ancestors who were enslaved, um, and, um, and therefore the responsibility of um, European countries and the white settler economies of North America, uh, Australia, New Zealand are profound. And so this isn't just about um, technological solutions um, uh, to continue existing. It's, it's a much deeper, harder question about what does it take um, to create a world where that extraction, that, um, uh, that system that created this cannot be set up again? And how do we get equity to indigenous communities? How do we get equity to black and brown communities? How do we, how do we create a world in which we understand that they have to be at the heart of this new future. Right. I see Varshini and Gloria both nodding. Um, can you both talk about how this affects your work? How is this happening on the ground with what you're doing? Varshini, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. You know, for me, what climate justice is racial justice means is that people who look like me all around the world's lives, their health, their well-being uh, matters and that they have inherent value. Um, and to me, it means that our young people who are in Texas and lost power for days because of the Texas freeze um, matter. It means that, you know, young people living in Colorado who are breathing in toxic air every single day because of the fires, um, their lives matter. And so to me, it's, it's a very lived reality, especially for young people these days who are not living single issue lives, who cannot construct a reality that is about the climate crisis in any way that is distinguished from the racial and economic disparities that we have um, across the nation and across, across the world. Um, and to me, it's about it's about solving the problem. If we are serious about solving the climate crisis, I strongly just don't believe that we would have the kind of existing environmental and climate inequality that we have in America and around the world if some people's lives didn't matter more than others. Um, there's no reason why pipelines would have been rerouted from wealthier, whiter communities to indigenous communities if those tribal nations hadn't undergone genocide, colonization, and then the systemic you know, disenfranchisement and, and, and loss of sovereignty over the last 400 years. Uh, we might have had a Green New Deal a decade ago if Black Lives Matter, um, because we would have seen the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and said, never again will that happen to people who, who matter in this country. Um, or, you know, we would have never uh, seen the conversion of, of, of slave plantations to uh, Cancer Alley in, in Louisiana, uh, communities that I visited earlier this year who are suffering egregious uh, cancer and, and so many other uh, diseases and problems. And so to me, we cannot solve these issues you know, in any way that isn't uh, ultimately, inexplicably, and ex explicitly connected. Gloria? Inextricably. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> no, we get it. Um, Gloria and Nick, what are your thoughts? So I'm appreciating all the comments, um, and really good seeing everyone. Good seeing you again, David. And thanks for having me, Veronica. 
um, at the Solutions Project, we're a national intermediary, uh, public foundation located in the United States. And we don't just believe, but we know that communities most impacted by the climate crisis, uh, Black, Indigenous, immigrant, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Latinx, and other people of color are leading, shaping, and innovating transformative and decolonized solutions rooted in an alternative value system. And we fund these communities and we amplify their solutions in the media in order to influence and shape public narrative, public policy, and the public debate. So it's always nice sharing time with people who understand that climate justice is racial justice and the time for change and action is now. And in the same breath, I would think that if any place is aware that BIPOC and poor communities are impacted the most, you would think that's clear at COP. On a global scale, folks are tired of experiencing the residual effects of colonialism and the values and systems that uphold it. And people are fed up and tired of an outdated system that is only serving a select few and purposefully sacrificing others. Varshini mentioned the work that's happening in what's sadly called Cancer Alley. Um, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm tired of it too, and, and I'm sure we're all definitely tired of talking about it. And so since we've known for generations that these communities are most impacted, the question today is now what? What are we doing about it, Conference of the Parties? In what ways are we centering the most impacted communities and the solutions? And what's the plan to be accountable to repair the harm and do better. COP is known for industry and governments coming together, and this year, community and our youth are attending in force. But now, they really need a seat at the table, a structural way to be involved in decision-making and shaping the agenda. Frontline communities in general, and the environmental justice movement in particular, as Varshini mentioned, has talked about an intersectional approach for decades. And yes, that's about issues being connected and everyone doing our part to accelerate a clean energy economy that benefits all people and protects and repairs the places that we call home. But when I started organizing um, 16, 17 years ago in South Central LA, I first learned about an intersectional approach as it related to power. Multiracial, multi-generational, multi-sector movements coming together joining each other in force, building and exercising collective power. And it's only when government and industry join forces with the power of community that we all win. And if COP leaves with anything from our panel, please leave understanding that community needs a seat at the table, shaping the agenda, enough talking, the time for change and action is now, and decolonized solutions is an imperative. So Veronica, I'm a little tired today. I was sharing with Nicholas and Varshney, but y'all about to get me started. <laughs> uh -huh. Nick, what would that you like to add? That was fantastic. Um, I'm just, I'm giving my snaps to everybody here. Uh, and thank you so much for having me on this panel. So I am a, a science and health reporter. And for the past, you know, year plus, I've been reporting on COVID and as many, as we've all seen, the pandemic has hit different communities differently, right? We're seeing black and brown communities being disproportionately affected by COVID. The same thing is happening with climate change in terms of the communities that, you know, are really bearing the, 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 the brunt of the force here. So as someone who reports on, on health disparities, I would just say that, you know, going forward, I hope, I hope what people take away from, you know, this conversation is just this increased focus on what is happening um, 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 health-wise in these communities, this increased focus on that this work matters. And I know it's been inspiring me to continue doing this work, not just looking at COVID, but also looking at the impacts of climate change in, in, in different communities and how whenever any huge, you know, environmental, um, you know, uh, occurrence happens, the, the, the people who are suffering the most. And one thing I'd, I'd love the chance to just bring up was when Hurricane Ida hit, um, there were stories about, you know, some of the people who, who, who died from that, we saw that um, there were deaths of, of, of Asian residents in, in, in basements. 
in this case because of the flooding and such. And those are like the infrastructure things that we need to take in mind, that we, we see this happening now. How do we prevent that going forward? And one thing I hope that other journalists also take away from this, this conference is, you know, we're seeing these stories play out. What can our work do? How can we be impactful to, to prevent it going forward as well? So, um, Gloria, I, I really want to just honor what you said about being tired. I think that, you know, the activism and the way that so many people have been carrying the ball, it's, it's exhausting work, and I want to recognize that. You know, I think one of the things that we understand is that the technological piece of this is inevitable, but the justice piece of it is not. Um, I'd like to ask Gloria and then David, to talk about that. How do we tie those two together so that you, get, you don't get one without the other? Yes. Um, so Nicholas, you have me thinking, you know, as I think about COVID and what it means to be a first responder. Um, and Varshini, you mentioned a lot of our grantee partners, actually. And, and so that's probably what I'm going to really elevate right now. Um, is thinking about our grantee partners, uh, who for me are representative of the social infrastructure, uh, the social fabric and backbones of our society. They're the ones behind the community organizations that are often operating behind the scenes. Uh, first responders, nonetheless, many of the same climate disasters that hit the rest of the world are also affecting us in the US, like hurricanes, ice storms, wildfires. And it's our frontline communities that our first responders to these climate disasters, along with firefighters and other disaster response folks, and are often first responders. Um, Nicholas, you talked about COVID when it comes to nurses and um, joining forces with nurses and doctors um, and providing mutual aid mm -hmm. to deal with COVID. And they're also the ones who are building power and leading and influencing our democracy. And I have to talk about Stand LA, um, you know, because that's where I started organizing in South Central. And it's a coalition standing together against neighborhood oil drilling. It's a coalition of community organizing and base building groups um, in partnership with churches and allies who organized and won a policy to end all new oil drilling and phase out existing drilling in Los Angeles, in LA. And they're starting up a just transition task force. It's okay, course. you can clap. People want to clap. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And starting up a just transition task force and piloting an oil cleanup program. And just a couple weeks ago, because of the work of Stand the Lake Coalition, the governor announced a 3,200 foot uh, setback between where oil drilling is happening and where children play and go to school and where families live. And I'm thinking about the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, rooted in New Orleans, uh, another one of our grantee partners, reaching communities across five states in the Gulf South in the U.S. And they have a vision for a green economy to be born out of the South, because particularly Black and Indigenous communities in the southern part of the U.S. see that decisions are literally being made that sacrifice their lives for profit. And as we talked about, you know, during Hurricane Ida, it was actually the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy who distributed 150 solar and storage kits to families who are without power in Louisiana so that they can have air conditioning and refrigeration and didn't have to rely on diesel generators. And they're advocating for a Green New Deal in the South, as Varshini knows. And we talked about, um, sadly, what's known as Cancer Alley, which is the home of Sharon Levine and her and her community members um, at Rise St. James um, organization in St. James Parish, Louisiana, fought and won stopping the construction of a $1.25 billion plastic manufacturing plant in a region called Cancer Alley. And it's called Cancer Alley because for decades, people have been dying because of high levels of carcinogens and toxic air pollution. Yet still, decisions are being made to either maintain or build more petrochemical plants. So it's like, Nicholas, it's like we have all this data, but we're still making decisions that are literally killing people. In Levine and her community, they're still organizing, they're filing lawsuits, they're getting media attention, they're raising awareness, they're building power and movement to keep oil in the ground. 
and move towards a clean energy economy. And then I have to just say one thing about, especially having the attention of people at COP about pipelines. And I'm thinking in particular about the pipeline that was stopped in, in Memphis, Tennessee, another um, Southern state in the United States. And Jesse, uh, Justin Pearson and his community successfully stopped the Bahalia pipeline in Tennessee. And now they're charting the course for pro-labor green infrastructure projects in Memphis. And the Biden-Harris administration and all of our world leaders and everyone at COP has an opportunity right now to stop line three in northern Minnesota. The White Earth Reservation, even though people are trying to build a pipeline through their community, this is a model where there's already practice of, practices of a regenerative economy. They're doing regenerative agriculture and wild rice cultivation, solar power, um, their tribal governments have an active and living wage. And then they're out front when it comes to COVID response. So please join forces with us and help stop line three because it's gonna pollute their water infrastructure. And this is an action that our governments can take right now. David. Those are wonderful examples. Um, look, I think the first place to start on technology is where is the world at today? And where the world at today is here at COP, in order to get in, um, you have to show a vaccine passport. That is exclusionary, because if you look at the people across the world, in Asia, in indigenous communities, in the continent of Africa, um, they haven't ac had access to the first vaccine let alone the second or the booster shot that we're now getting over here. The world is currently, the developed world is currently denying them the intellectual property um, to have access to it in an equitable way. Um, so we see the greed, we see the meanness, we see the selfishness in relation to developed population writ large in a pandemic. Why would climate be any different? Um, and so there has to be an impatience uh, and a suspicion uh, at the center of any debate about climate justice. And yeah, of course we need technological innovation and solar and renewable. That is absolutely quintessential to our future. But let us remember that the biggest invention that we have um, to deal with carbon capture are our forests. Um, uh, and as beautiful as this venue is, and it's, it's stunning, uh, and this is a nod to the environment, the truth is it's taken until now, this COP, to give those indigenous communities the 1.7 billion that they need to be protected. Uh, and that is nothing compared to the way that the West has subsidized fossil fuels. So again, the equity uh, is not built in. Um, I, I, the 100 billion is not a ceiling, it is the start of this conversation. And I would say also that until we get real about the intellectual property that should sit in the hands of the global south, we aren't serious about those technological uh, changes that are required. If, if, if it's all about MIT or Imperial or Cambridge or Oxford owning it all and not sharing with the developed world, developing world, then we aren't really clear about the equity that's needed for black and brown people across the world. Let me give you one other small example. It's yes. tangential, but let me give you an example. It's another now example. So you get this move that we've got across the global world to decriminalize marijuana. Who were the people arrested for marijuana <laughs> in America or in, the, or in the UK? They were black and brown people. And where are they uh, as these big warehouses with industrial lights are being built to grow this new marijuana? I spoke recently to um, the government of Jamaica 
-hmm. And they said to us, do you know what? They're not even allowing us to export our marijuana that's not grown under industrial lights. The developed community have mobilized to exclude us. That is the reality that countries mm -hmm. are experiencing just on that subject. So this business of fighting the injustice, of arguing for equity, of sharing the technology, mm -hmm. of recognizing those who always had the technology, indigenous communities is vital and fundamental in this fight. Great. Um, I wanna keep going because we have a lot to talk about and time is going fast. Britain has a very ambitious net zero target. Will people of color as individuals and communities be able to do the things government wants them to do? What are the hurdles, economic or otherwise? Well, it would help if we had a leader in Britain, a prime minister who didn't insult black and brown people. Um, you know, we, we, he insulted Muslim women, um, described them as wearing telephone boxes. Um, he, um, you know, look, we need a green home grant, proper grant, so that people can get out of fuel poverty here in the UK. 12% of white people are living in fuel poverty um, um, and can't heat their homes. 20% um, of black people are living in those circumstances. I am not aware of Boris Johnson. It's actually not a theme here in Europe, climate justice, of talking about how black and brown people um, can benefit in this new dawn. We haven't heard that uh, conversation. It's really not present in the European um, debate. I'm pleased to see projects like the Solutions Project in, in the United States, but we, 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 where are the versions, really, the mm. significant versions that government's aware of in a country like the UK? So, yes, we, the ambition is there, but the the, the equity, I, I don't think, is built in. I've got to be, I've got to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have, by the way, a government here in the UK, and I would ask you to look at the Sewell report that denies the existence of um, systemic racism, that does not think there's an account for decolonization, uh, and thinks that critical race theory is a sort of quack um, Marxist project coming out of Harvard University, and that's a government minister saying that. So I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious, frankly, of, mm. of how you get to that um, net zero uh, with equity properly for black and brown people here in the UK. Mm -hmm. I have a question um, for Vashni and Gloria. T to the point of we know that these issues of climate change affect our vulnerable communities disproportionately. Is there a future where the benefit will be greater to our communities, to the question of I can't breathe and the vulnerability of the rising waters and everything else? Um, Varshni and then Gloria, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah. I think that could absolutely be a possibility. Um, and, you know, I got to say, whether or not that becomes a reality, I, I'm not betting on people in Washington, D.C. or people in the White House. If anything, I'm betting on the grassroots. Um, I'm betting on young people showing up both, you know, in the streets, but also at the ballot boxes. Um, I'm betting on many of the you know, powerful, powerful groups that Gloria mentioned and so many others that we work with on a daily basis that are working to manifest a different set of, of values in this nation than what we have experienced in the last 40 or 50 years. Um, I think anything short of a complete um, uh, transformation and revolution in how we govern and run this country um, you know, economically, societally, that is what is necessary to solve the problems that we are facing. Um, and I think, you know, what is exciting about this moment is there are so many solutions that have already been written that are like legislation in waiting um, that have been uh, 
derived from expertise, like real experience that people on the ground have had, um, whether it's poor people, people of color, tribal nations, young people, we're already seeing it trickling into the climate plans of some of the most powerful people in the country um, and may even pass <laughs> in the next few weeks, uh, God willing. And I think what is necessary in this moment is to get really clear that right now we have the technology, we have the public mandate, we have the popular will from people um, in the United States, we have uh, the resources. Like I never want to hear that we do not have the resources because we absolutely do uh, in this nation to solve this problem. The very thing that we, the only thing that we are currently lacking is the political will. Um, and so I think that what needs to happen is, is we need to be organizing our communities far more effectively. We need to be governing long-term and getting our people into the halls of power. We need to have a really smart and savvy internal and external strategy for how we get it done. And we need to put a lot of that legislation in waiting and those ideas that have been lying around and make them commonplace uh, and, and, and ensure that they can have tangible changes on people's lives. Um, so I believe that it is possible, but we have a lot to overcome. And I have no doubt that the fossil fuel industry is going to fight tooth and nail and give it everything that it's got to stop us. Um, but we've got to be stronger. We've got to be more united. And the very playbook that organizations like the fossil fuel, that industry um, and, and elites have used is divide and conquer. Um, and so why we need to be clear about our solidarity across race lines, across class lines, intergenerationally, is because dividing us is the best strategy that they've got to ensuring that we cannot solve this problem. Um, so yeah, I think we can do it, but it, it's going to require a lot of good organizing and a hell of a lot of solidarity to get there. Yes, so I'm right there with you, Varshini, and I also believe that we can do it. And at the Solutions Project, we want to partner with other organizations who believe that we can do it and who understand that it is about being in solidarity with local communities. At the Solutions Project, as I mentioned, we fund solutions across the United States and territories like Puerto Rico. Um, that's really solutions that are rooted in local communities. And so what that means, and I tried to highlight some of these solutions that are already underway, is that communities are not waiting on us. Mm -hmm. The solutions are already underway. Decolonization is happening. And so now we just have to imagine what's possible when governments, industry, and philanthropy rapidly and exponentially scale financial commitments to these frontline communities. And you know, Varshini, you kind of like invoked this, um, some examples I want to share just about how these great leaders are looking towards community, right? So earlier this year um, in the U.S., the Biden-Harris administration put out this Justice 40 executive order, which stated that about 40 percent of the benefits from the federal climate right. action must flow to disadvantaged communities. And we know 40 percent ain't justice, but, but it's a start. But the point is that this was in part inspired by our partners in New York State. Uprose, Push Buffalo, Align, New York Environmental Justice Alliance, they're the ones who fought hard and won the country's strongest climate bill, the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act in New York, which is about 100% clean energy. And there is a mandate to direct at least 40% of those investments to environmental justice communities. And following the Biden-Harris commitment, the Solutions Project was asked to join forces with some of our grantee partners and launch a Justice 40 accelerator that's really about prioritizing investment in frontline communities across sectors in the U.S. And as the country is building back better with the Justice 40 accelerator, we're trying to ensure that frontline communities are centered in that plan. So that's just one example of translating talk into action action that centers communities most impacted and communities that are really leading the way. And David, I think you mentioned how right now, you know, 
we can achieve more, really, and it's requiring us to, to achieve more than net zero. Many scientists have said that if we all do our part, net zero is attainable. But what our communities are saying is that attaining net zero ain't enough. It's actually a moment where we can't have the same society that's just clean, but still has racism and income inequality and all the isms that are creating these problems today. Our communities are saying, if we're gonna move away from an extractive economy, then we have to replace it with one that's regenerative and reparative and a whole new set of values that stem from our local communities. And so that's what this moment is requiring us to do. Yes, attain net zero, which we can do, and create a society that's rooted in community-driven values. I, I would just emphasize that that 40%, um, which is admirable by the Biden administration, there is no 40% in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Canada next door, um, trying, I mean, y y you would like 3% if you were um, Aboriginal in Australia. So where are the equivalents and where are the demands, I think, of other leaders to step up and get serious about that decolonization and about giving those communities back what they deserve? Yes, step up and get serious. Yes. Um, I want to open it to questions right, uh, very soon. Yes, I was going to ask you a question, Nick, but jump in. Right, no, I, I just wanted to jump on a, a question you had asked earlier about technology and what we need to be doing. And one aspect I want to make sure we get the chance to, to address is in terms of a low-hanging fruit for, for technology to, well, not really a low-hanging fruit, but we need to do more to address misinformation. Um, I need to bring it back to COVID again, because I feel COVID was showing the climate crisis on a, a, an expediated scale, if you will, in terms of, you know, we've had scientists who have been heralding, have been saying, you know, we need to pay attention to climate change. We need to do, you know, X, Y, Z to, 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 to solve this. We have scientists have been talking about what we need to do to get COVID under control. And we saw so many people, we saw it politicized, people not listening to scientists. We saw online all types of misinformation that same playbook, um, you know, that we just saw with, with, with COVID has been going on for decades with, with, with climate change in terms of trying to, you know, muck up the science there or, or, or sow division in as well. So in terms of technologies that we need, we need to find a better way of addressing misinformation. We need to find a better way of making sure that scientists are heard and listened to. Um, so I just wanted to also Paul yeah. said in there as well, because this is, this is another area that we really need to be on the front line. Yeah, I want to ask one last question, and I'm going to throw it to Nick and then to David. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about the importance of what do we do to make sure that the leaders, scientists, and journalists addressing the questions of climate look as diverse as the communities that we're mm -hmm. talking about, that, that this isn't just something where in a lot of forums that aren't <laughs> all people of color panels like this one, um, that we're not talking about climate change as happening to certain kinds of people, but we're actually letting, building up the leadership in science and in leadership. So Nick, I mean, I'd love for you to talk about it because there's probably not 100 or 200 science journalists like you in the US working at national publications. Is that right? Right, right. I mean, there are brilliant, uh, science, uh, reporters of color covering climate. Um, there's Daryl Fears over at the Washington Post. There's, there's Drew Costley over at AP. Um, there's Kendra Pierre-Lewis. There, there are so many of us. I think outlets are, are beginning to value more and more um, that kind of compassion or that insight that comes from journalists of color reporting on these big issues that affect people of color. Um, uh, I know in my past work, there's there's just this, this special bond you get when you're talking to a source who, who, who looks like you, who, who has been, you know, facing such, 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 such hardships at, um, in my case, mostly having to do with the, the, the medical institutions, but 
answers and, and all of these things that, that stem from racial injustices, especially in the US. Um, there's, this, there's this extra layer that really brings out in us as reporters, you know, us doing what we are meant to be doing. Um, I think we look at it, as I had mentioned, with, with, with a lens of compassion that might make us better suited for covering these communities, covering the, these stories. And, and, you know, with my colleagues and such, we've been talking about this for a while, right? I think 20, uh, 20 2021, the, 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 the pandemic has really put that to the forefront in terms of this intersection of, of, of racial injustice, um, and just all the different areas and science of which we cover. So to your point there, yes, there needs to be more, but there's plenty of us out here who are doing the work as well. And I think we're getting recognized more and more for this as well. David, do you wanna talk about the leadership pipeline? Well, a few years ago, about five years ago, um, I challenged Oxford and Cambridge University because I had been the university's minister under Gordon Brown. I knew where the bodies were buried. Uh, and it was clear to me that there were more young people with the surname Smith at those institutions than black young people. Um, they just, and it wasn't that they didn't have the grades to go, it's that they weren't being let in. Things have got a bit better, but they are not where they need, they, they need to be. So where are the bursaries? Where are the scholarships, environmental science and related sectors? They have to be done at scale and with speed, not hearing enough about that, and there are real issues for all organizations um, around setting yourself targets, the appropriate KPIs, holding yourself to it, holding senior leaders to it, challenging middle managers, appraising them against diversity, and also affecting your supply chain and your procurement so that you are investing back into those communities that are trying to do something. There is a bit of a myth that can come out of things like COP which is almost that white people are gonna save the world, they aren't gonna save the world. All of us together are gonna to save the world. So can we start empowering oh gosh, some black and brown people right there, to right? be part of it? Wow. Hey. <laughs> Speaking truth to power here, do people have questions? Brashni, do you look like you wanted to say something? while we're waiting for the next question. Oh no, oh, come on no. up. I, I mean, it feels, I, I feel the same way also with, um, you know, in, in organizations like Sunrise and how we're developing out the next generation of powerful political leaders who are leaders of color, who are low income people. And part of the historical legacy of the environmental movement in America is that, um, you know, we have to actively work to train, to resource, to leadership develop, to coach, to mentor uh, young volunteers that are going to be the vanguards of these social movements on a variety of issues for decades to come. And it is incumbent on people who are in civil society, who are in nonprofits, in, in, in social movement organizations, wherever you are, to constantly be thinking, how am I developing and uh, bringing up people behind me who are gonna continue this fight. Because I can tell you, we are way, way smaller than we need to be. We need to be bringing in like thousands and thousands and thousands more people who wake up every single day understanding that this is their mission um, and, and purpose in life and cultivating that sense of agency and power in people. Thank you. Sorry, uh, you have the mic out, you want the question. Thank you, no, that was great. First, thanks to the four, four of you for all the work that you do. This was really inspiring. I have a bit of a kind of a challenge of a question. Um, this is still a very Global North panel. And I think sometimes the solutions that we see in the Global North kind of push the problem to the Global South. There's kind of this balloon effect or unintended consequences. Um, and so I think there's a fear that sometimes, right, we, we talk about renewable energies and then those will be mined in, in, in the Global South again, the open veins of Latin America or Africa. So I think my question to you is, as advocates working in the Global North on racial justice, what do you see can be the work and role that you can play to make sure that the solutions that you're bringing to your community are not pushing problems to those who are already very vulnerable and already right the, the, at the forefront of the climate disaster, 
but also the first one, also those who were the ones most affected by colonialism and settler colonialism. Thank you. You can ask a second question. Oh, sorry? Questions. You can ask a few questions. So sure. That we'll get do, you wanna, um, do we want to get a couple of questions going? Another question? And then we'll answer yeah. them yeah. in Hello. this session. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for the talk. I think it's extremely important. Um, I have the maybe the embarrassment of uh, being nominally Australian. And uh, at the COP in the Blue Zone, there is a, a stand for Australia where there's a company called Santos. And Santos is showing a carbon sequestration apparatus as a giant model. And at the same time, the same company is going into vulnerable uh, communities in the Northern Territory and using 1,084 chemicals, many of which are toxic, to frack the Northern Territory. And this calls into question the uh, instrumentalization of uh, carbon capital. And it also calls into question the political dynamics behind how this could happen in the first place. Um, I feel like the biggest tragedy of COP is actually uh, represented by people who are not at COP, not the people who are at the table. And um, I'd like you perhaps, well, first of all, I would like to maybe get a spotlight on this from the New York Times as an effort of solidarity to represent the plight of the Aborigines in this area. Secondly, um, I would like to, you to discuss the, uh, the political dynamics that are behind this and how that relates to the continuing colonialism that ex exists in Australia. Okay, so um, do we have any other questions? We'll look, do you center. want to take one more? Got one in the center there. Okay. Maybe. Thank you, that was incredible. And I've heard a lot of dust transitions panels over the last week or so. I think we're all paneled out, but I truly think that was great. So thank you so much. Um, as a person of color, uh, and, and for context, I work a lot on kind of non state actor engagement on net zero as part of the Climate Champions team. And often it feels like there is a, a very significant role for the private sector to play in climate justice, but still we still focus on net zero as kind of a siloed objective. Um, for countries that are preoccupied with civil unrest, social inequality, and ensuring that there are fewer people who live below a dollar a day, what role do you think the private sector has to play and how do you see that come to life in ensuring that, that these countries that are preoccupied with other very real considerations? actually make significant progress on the journey towards net zero because the 100 billion we uh, we can all hope that it comes through and it's looking likely but that's not gonna that like we said that's a drop in the ocean <laughs> very good let me take in? i'll just take the the, the first two now um uh, the, the point you made about the global north is correct um i should just say um I, i'm very proud to be a member of parliament here in the UK and do what I can um, within our political system. But I am, I always bring to the table the fact that my parents are from the country of Guyana and that I am formed by the country of Guyana. It's the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. If you haven't heard of it, it's a very important country. It's where Exxon are drilling today. It's the biggest oil find um, in a generation. And 80% of the, of the country is covered in rainforest. So, the way that the story goes in Guyana over the next 10 to 20 years signals how serious we are about this issue. And uh, in that country, I, I, I'm uh, part of a partnership called Sophia Point, which is a conservation center um, that centers indigenous communities um, and local black and brown Guyanese at the center of conserving their rainforests. So you can do both at the same time, uh, remembering that communities, certainly here in Europe, um, always are in relationship with the Global South. We have relatives in the Global South, so this divide and rule, we're not up for. We sit in both places um, deliberately. Uh, thank you, brother, for raising the issues um, in Australia. I'm privileged to have been to nearly every single country in the world, and the plight of Aboriginal people in Australia um, is a disgrace. And there is much, much more for the political class to do um, in that country. 
Um, and again, um, and there are obviously global concerns about where Australia sits in relation to this debate about the climate emergency, but, but where this leaves Aboriginal people um, just fills my heart with so much pain, and there aren't enough people speaking up for them. So thank you for raising uh, them and bringing them to the fore. Um, Vashni and Gloria, do you guys want to address the issue of people dealing with day-to-day -day issues of living in poverty, living beneath the poverty line, <coughs> and how we keep the focus on climate change while trying to address the day-to-day -day issues of people's lives? Is, is that how the question should be formed? Do either one of you want to take a crack at that? Um, yeah, so I'm appreciating all of the questions and, you know, the first thing is there is no denying the harm that happens to a lot of the Black, Indigenous, Immigrant, uh, Latinx, API communities in the U.S. and across the globe. Um, and a lot of our communities here are very much aware of the harm that's been done globally. And even for ourselves, like we're deliberately trying to build relations uh, internationally and in particularly with the global south, um, you know, countries in Africa. Um, we want to not only build, um, but share stories, share solutions, share strategies, recognizing that it's not about always replicating what's working in the US and other places, but it's joining forces with people in those places who are working with communities on the ground, who know culturally relevant solutions, um, who can advocate for solutions that are not causing more harm. Um, I think being in relationship and communicating about what we're doing here versus what's happening there can help us all do our part um, when it comes to not causing more harm. I think that we have to join forces with organizations on the ground who are advocating to decision makers not to cause more harm so that we all can make decisions with a heightened level of awareness about the impacts, the reverberating impacts. Um, that are happening here in the U.S. and across the world. Um, when it comes to the private sector, whether it's government, uh, philanthropy, like all of our major sectors right now, like we're pushing for these sectors to, to invest in local communities. Um, communities that are, as we've talked about, disproportionately impacted, but most importantly, leading solutions that are moving from a decolonized mindset, uh, solutions that are about regenerative practices, that are about community, that's about reparations um, and, and repairing the harm that's been done. So we're definitely advocating for all of us to, to play our roles. Um, and most importantly, you know, when we talk about intersectional approaches, as I mentioned earlier, yes, it's about the issues, but it really is about the power uh, that's built when we join forces and the vision um, that can happen when we're communicating with each other and um, not being separated by these uh, barriers, these natural barriers that are there. And so we're definitely trying to do our part to build those relationships um, so that we can help spur more solutions across the world and, and join forces with others so that people know that, you know, we're not alone in this fight and a lot of us are experiencing um, a lot of the same harm, although the face of it really does look different. And often the political context is different too. And, and that's the, the cultural sensitivity um, that we're trying to move with and, and really trying to get our decision makers to move with as well. Well, thank you so much to this panel and to our audience, to Nick St. Fleur, Gloria Walton, David Lamy, Varshini Prakash, um, thank you. And, I think there's been a lot of good conversation come out of this. So.